So my story is a little weird, mainly because it's haunted me since I was a little girl. And I only recently found that final piece to the puzzle that makes it, well, extra creepy. I'll never see my ghost in the mirror with my eyes closed. Adapted from the true story submitted by Ghost Coffee Shop and Amy Koto. Narrated by Nikki Young of the Serial Napper podcast. Cameron, my current boyfriend, is someone that I've known all my life. His parents and my parents were friends who would offer to trade babysitting duties. So playdates and sleepovers were common for us during elementary school. When I was seven, my family was super poor. My dad worked a swing shift factory job, and my mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. There was often no one around to watch me. So that meant lots of nights sleeping at Cameron's house. I remember that I would always beg his parents to let us sleep in their room. They never let us, but I remember many nights we'd get up in the middle of the night and we'd drag our sleeping bags into the hall so that we could sleep outside their door. Cameron didn't care one way or the other, but I remember always wanting to be as close to the grown-ups as I could whenever I was in that house especially at night. During those sleepovers with Cameron's family, I'd always have the most effed up nightmares. It's weird because I'm not someone who normally remembers her dreams. And yet, those nightmares have stuck with me for more than 20 years. In one of the nightmares, I was hiding in a laundry basket, which was a favorite hiding place for me during games of hide and seek and it was totally dark in the room, except for a sliver of light coming from the bathroom at the end of the hall. This is important later. I remember being totally alone and completely terrified, but I didn't remember why. I remember trying to run away, but I couldn't because I felt stuck. All I knew was there was something grotesque waiting for me in that bathroom. My dream self never opened the bathroom door, but I kept seeing flashes of a decaying old woman. It scared the snot out of me. After having that nightmare, I'd never use that bathroom at Cameron's house. The one at the end of the hall, across from his parents' room. I remember sometimes I'd wait until my mom came to pick me up and drive me home to use the potty. Well, years passed. Cameron and I grew apart until we met up again in college and we started dating. His parents retired and started taking lots of trips. Now, Cameron and I share a small apartment in Rochester, though we always jump at opportunities to drive out to his big childhood home to house sit for his parents while they're traveling, sometimes for weeks at a time. Two or three years ago, I was house sitting for Cameron's parents Cameron was at work, so I was just there alone with my dog, Hazelnut. We were watching TV alone in the living room, and I heard a door slam upstairs. So I went up to see what was going on. Every door upstairs was open, except the one to the bathroom. The one at the end of the hall, across from his parents' room. I opened the bathroom door. Don't ask me why and turned on the light, along with just about every other light upstairs. I went back down to the living room and heard the door slam again. But I tried to tell myself that the noise might be something outside, maybe the neighbors, so I kind of ignored it. But then the radio in the living room came on extremely loud. It was playing that song, Dead, by They Might Be Giants. I switched off the radio and checked to make sure if there wasn't an alarm or some other setting on it that would cause it to turn back on. Then, the bathroom door slammed again. Remember, this is the second time I heard it slam after the one time I went upstairs to open it. So if it slammed once before, shouldn't it already be closed? This time, I took Hazel upstairs with me because I needed some backup. When I got to the top of the stairs, I saw that most of the lights were turned on except for the bathroom. 
All the doors, which had been open last time, were now closed, except for the bathroom. The one at the end of the hall, across from the master bedroom. Then, without warning, the bathroom light flicked back on. I say flicked because I heard the clicking noise, as if a finger had flicked the switch. About that point, Hazel wriggled out of my arms and ran back downstairs, barking and whimpering. Now, what I did next was stupid. I don't know why I did it, but something compelled me to go up and turn the bathroom light back on. Believe me, I did this very quickly because I couldn't bear to even get my whole body into the doorway. When I switched the light back on, two things seemed to happen all at once. The first thing was the radio came screaming back to life, even louder than before, if that's possible. And it was playing the same song again, dead by They Might Be Giants. The second thing was the mirror. When I switched the light back off and the radio came back on, I jumped and ran back downstairs. But as I turned away from the bathroom, the lights switched on again and I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the mirror except that I didn't see my own reflection at all. I saw the reflection of the woman from my childhood nightmares. Oddly, the woman reflected in the mirror was standing in the exact spot where I was standing. It was standing in a spot that would have been just over my shoulder. And remember, my image wasn't being reflected in the mirror, as if it had been erased. I was so scared that I left the house to stay the night with my sister. I even left the radio playing. I called my boyfriend in a panic. I was in tears and I asked him if anyone had ever died in that house. Cameron said that's strange because he was just talking to his dad a couple of weeks earlier and the subject of the house's previous tenants came up. His dad had told him that before they lived there, an old lady had died in the bathroom the one at the end of the hall, across from the master bedroom. In fact, if it wasn't for that death, Cameron's family might not have been able to afford such a large house. Apparently, the caretaker that the old lady had been living with took all of the old lady's money and then left the body in the bathroom to rot. Cameron said that she'd been dead for days before anyone ever found her. I tried to avoid staying in that house alone anymore. The last time I did, I heard the door slamming, but I didn't stick around long enough to see if the radio came on. I'm now convinced that my childhood nightmare wasn't a dream at all. I believe that I saw the ghost of the old lady, and I just rationalized to myself that I was dreaming because my Gravy Train A true story submitted by Melody K Narrated by Lady Vengeance I had just landed my first big corporate job out of college and was new to the city Between long hours at the office and frequent happy hours with co-workers, I often found myself taking a later train home. A lot of times, I would ride the last train of the night. My stop closest to my house was near the end of the line, which meant a long commute on the train with a switchover to another train on another line in the middle of my trip. Anyway, I got used to sitting all alone, or mostly alone, in those huge underground stations while I waited for a train. It was always a little spooky, but when you do it day in and day out, you get used to it. Once in a while, I'd see trains pull into the stations with the lights off in the last two cars. I assumed these cars were out of service for whatever reason. Typically, the doors to these darkened cars, or ghost cars as I began to think of them, wouldn't open when the train pulled into the station. Like I said, I always assumed these cars were out of service due to electrical or some other technical issues. But one night, I was out late after an epic session at a new bar near DuPont Circle. The metro was busy that night. I remember I was sitting on a bench watching a group of kids dancing when my train pulled up. I saw that on this train, the last two cars were ghost cars, except this time, 
the doors opened. Don't ask me why I did it. Maybe it was because I was buzzed. Maybe the noise of that busy metro station was getting to me. Maybe I just wanted to doze off on the train and not be bothered by people. But for whatever reason, I boarded one of the unlit ghost cars. At first, it was really cool and somewhat relaxing. Nobody else on board to bother me, nice and quiet, no offensive odors, etc. All I could see were the lights inside the tunnel as they whizzed by. It was hypnotic watching them pass, like being aboard a spaceship at warp speed. Then, I noticed we weren't stopping at any stations, weren't even passing through any stations. It was all tunnel. I told myself that I'd been nodding off and had slept through all the stops, but I finally breathed a sigh of relief when we pulled into my station. Weird thing was, the digital station identification screens inside and outside the train didn't display the name of my stop. The screens just said, end of line. It was weird, but in the moment I didn't give it much thought. I was the only passenger to get off the train even though I hadn't noticed us stopping at any other stations and I remember that other people were piling into the other train cars, the ones with the lights on, when I got on. Yet, as I stepped off the train and onto the platform, I couldn't see anyone else anywhere in the train as it disappeared into the tunnel. My stop was in another underground station and I was used to it being much quieter than the bustling stops downtown, but not quite like this. There was no one in this station but me. No other passengers, no station manager, no metro police, not even other trains pulling in and out of the station. No one. Again, this in itself wasn't all that odd. I kept unusual hours and was used to finding deserted stations, especially this late at night. But this one was different. Like a tomb. I got on the escalator to leave the station, but it took me up to the same platform I was trying to leave. Not a similar platform, but the exact same platform. The signs and advertisement, the lights, even the blobs of chewing gum on the concrete were identical. In a panic, I rode the escalator several times, but always ended up in the same place. And to prove to myself it was the same place, I took some lipstick out of my purse and drew a star on the corner of one of the benches. The next time I rode the escalator, I ran to the bench and saw that the star I'd drawn was still there. Every time I returned to the platform, it was always the same bench with the same star drawn on it with lipstick. Until one time, I walked past it and noticed that the lipstick had been smeared, even though I had never touched it and had not sat on the bench since drawing it. I freaked out, as you can imagine. I must have gone up those escalators dozens of times trying to find a way out. I forgot to mention there was no emergency exit doors anywhere. I was starting to wonder whether I'd have to run into the blackness of the tunnels, use a cell phone, which had no service in this station, as a flashlight to find a way out. I was working up the courage to do just that when the most f***ed up thing happened. I heard voices. It almost sounded like two people having a conversation at the farthest end of the platform. The sound of their voice would cut in and out, and I could never quite place where they were. I kept turning around to try to spot them, but the voices always seemed out of reach. If I was on the escalator, it would sound as though they were on the platform, and if I was on the platform, I could hear the voices receding like people chatting on the escalator. Finally, I grew tired and just wanted a place to hide. I climbed under the bench I'd drawn the star on, half expecting the owner or owners of those voices to walk by any second. Scared as I was, I had to keep fighting sleep. And just as my eyes began to shut, I'd hear the voices again. This time, I hear the voice, and it sounds like the speaker is whispering just over my shoulder. It said, We were never really alive. Suffice it to say, it took me about three quarters of a second to nope it right out of there, running down the platform. My legs caught on some object, on an empty platform, that nearly tripped me, but I didn't stop. Whatever it was had cut my leg, leaving a scar that I have to this day. And then, a moment later, 
a real train, not a ghost train, rolled into the station. I boarded it at a sprint and pressed my body against the walls of the train at the farthest point from the open door, afraid that the thing in the station might follow me inside. I felt blood trickling down my leg from my wound, but couldn't bring myself to look down. When the train finally arrived at my stop, I jogged all the way home. I haven't been able to figure out how I ended up on that strange car and how I managed to escape that ghost station, but I haven't gotten on another train since that night. I probably never will. I'm thinking about my death now. When you gonna ring it? When you gonna ring it? A true story submitted by The 8-Bit Tinner, narrated by Edward October. Mr. Gary, the band director at my high school, was also a member of my church. One year, he formed this uh, youth ministry handbell choir. Most of the kids in it were also in the marching band and could already read music. We all had about three or four bells to ring. Each bell was a different pitch, etc. Every weekend between Easter and summer break, we loaded in a white van and traveled out to the other churches in our district to perform at uh, potlucks and pancake breakfasts and all sorts of different church events. I remember this one church was a far piece up in the mountains and, and we had to drive up this long, winding, narrow road just to get up there. There were lights on uh, both sides of the road. It looked kind of like runway lights, you know, like at the airport. And they used to help guide cars through fog banks. I mean, that's how high up a mountain we were. Well, anyways, we played our songs, Amazing Grace, Our God's an Awesome God, Onward Christian Soldiers, all the hits. And then we went into the church's uh, fellowship hall for a little reception. We were eating on uh, tater chips with dip, drinking pop, eating pound cake, when this one woman came up to us bragging about uh, how good we played. And her face was all red, and her eyes were red and puffy like she'd been crying. The whole time she kept staring at me and patting my shoulder. She finally broke away from us and gave me a big old hug. But now, remember, this woman was a stranger to me. I had never seen her in my life, and I didn't know her from Adam. But then, a minute later, this other lady from the church went up to me apologizing for the crying lady's behavior. She just had to meet you, she said. Her son died about a year ago in a car accident, and you're his spitting image. You look just like him. Turns out, he died on that road we just traveled up. The one with the fog lights on it. Kind of weird, right? Cousin, I felt about like a white horse that just walked over my grave. Well, anyways, we load up in the van and turn around and head back to go back down the mountain. It was just right about sundown. And a fog had rolled in, and Mr. Gary really had to crawl along that mountain road and hug those guide lights we laughed about on the way up. By and by, we come along to this uh, hairpin turn. And I mean, it was a real twisty, kiss your hind end kind of turn. And in the middle of that turn, Mr. Gary slams on his brakes. Because there's this nut job standing in the middle of the road. It was too dark and foggy to make out his features. He seemed to be crossing from one side of the road to the other. So we just come to a complete stop right there in the middle of the road and waited for him to pass. Well, anyways, here comes his car driving up a mountain and comes screaming around a bend with its high beams on and blindness and all that fog. If we hadn't have stopped for this uh, pedestrian, Mr. Gary would have surely been blinded by that car and we might have ended up rolling off the side of the mountain. By the time the car passed us, the guy crossing the road had just up and vanished. But before we headed back down the mountain, we noticed another thing. A little memorial on the roadside. It was a wreath of flowers placed there at the bend in the road, with one of those guide lights shining up on it. There were some mementos leaning against the wreath, and one of them was a photograph in a frame that had Remember Me written on it picture was of a guy about 18 or 19 and he looked just exactly like me this halloween october pod has the double double for your toil and trouble tune in to october pod am wherever you get podcasts on october 24th to hear 
The Spirit Doll, a spectacular new audio drama starring your favorite indie podcasters and written by maniacs. <laughs> then on Halloween Day, visit October Pod Home Video on YouTube, where Edward October will be telling Halloween bedtime stories. A family friendly special that's perfect for getting your children off the night off to sleep. Yes, it's double the Halloween fry and double the Halloween fun when you listen to October Pod AM's presentation of The Spirit Doll on October 24th, wherever you get podcasts. And watch October Pod home videos, bedtime stories for Halloween, narrated by Edward October. Find October Pod on the World Wide Web at OctoberPodVHS.com. October Pod. Retro horror for bold individualists. Pull the strings! Welcome to Shatsunami, a variety podcast that discusses topics from gaming and films to anime and general interests. Previously on Shatsunami, we've analysed what makes a good horror game, conducted a retrospective on Pierce Brosnan's runs James Bond, and listened to us take deep dives into both the Sonic and Halo franchises. Also, if you're an anime fan, then don't forget to check us out on our sub-series, Chatsunani, where we dive into the world of anime. So far, we've reviewed things like Death Note, Princess Mononoke, and the hit Beyblade series. If that's so- sounds like your cup of tea, then you can check us out on Spotify, iTunes, and all good podcast apps. As always, stay safe, stay awesome, and most importantly, stay hydrated. Hello, my name is Kayla, and my co-host Lexi and I host a podcast called A Little Wicked. On our show, we discuss true crime cases such as serial killers, missing persons, and victims of crime along with cults, conspiracies, cryptids, urban legends, and everything in between. Find us on Apple, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. I'm Edward October. For more true, true true-ish, and classic tales of horror and the paranormal, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to ring the bell so you don't miss anything. Or find all of our links at octoberpodvhs.com. Octoberpod. Retro horror for bold individualists.